Okay, welcome back to week 10, Americana, Cultural Phenomena in Contemporary American Society. So this week, uh, we are going to start off by focusing on the uh, years uh, 2000 to 2021 uh, time frame with a quick look at some of the iconic popular cultural moments that may have helped shape your early childhood to adult timeline. So this is your time. And in our reflection this week, I want you to write about your own personal experience with popular culture that you may have experienced uh, growing up. So we're going to take a look at some just again really quick iconic popular cultural moments in the last 20 years and this is by no means a complete coverage of that. It's just a small sample and I'm sure you may have a lot to add uh, to this through your own experience. So uh, from there, we'll kind of jump back a little bit and uh, talk about some of the early uh, folklore that influenced uh, American uh, contemporary uh, popular culture. Uh, these are iconic uh, people, fables that uh, all Americans uh, know about and you should too. Okay, so let's begin with a look at um, the year 2000, and we will move very quickly up to today. Okay, let's talk about the game Sims. This is a series of life simulation video games developed by Maris and published by Electronic Arts. The franchise has sold nearly 200 million copies worldwide and it is one of the best selling video game series of all time. Game designer Will Wright was inspired to create a virtual dollhouse after losing his home during the Oakland firestorm of 1991 and subsequently rebuilding his life. Replacing his home and his other possessions made him think about adapting that life experience into a game. When Wright initially took his ideas to the Maris Board of Directors, they were skeptical and gave little support or financing for the game. The directors of Electronic Arts, which bought Maris in 1997, were more receptive. Sim City has been a great success for them, and they foresaw the possibility of building a strong Sim franchise. Wikipedia was launched January 15, 2001 by Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger. Sanger coined its name as a combination of wiki, the Hawaiian word for quick, and encyclopedia. Initially, an English language encyclopedia, versions in other languages were quickly developed. Wikipedia has been criticized for its uneven accuracy and for exhibiting systematic bias, particularly gender bias, with the majority of editors being male. In 2006, Time magazine stated that the open door policy of allowing anyone to edit had made Wikipedia the biggest and perhaps the best encyclopedia in the world and a testament to the version 
of Jimmy Waite. The 2001 attack on the Pentagon and World Trade Center, 911. The cultural influence of the September 11 attacks has been profound and long lasting. The impact of 9 11 has extended beyond geopolitics into society and culture in general. Immediate responses to 9 11 included greater focus on home life and time spent with family, higher church attendance, and increased expressions of patriotism, such as flying the American flag. The radio industry responded by removing certain songs from playlists, and the attacks have subsequently been used as background, narrative, or thematic elements in film, television, music, and literature. Already running television shows, as well as programs developed after 9-11, have reflected post 9-11 cultural concerns. 9-11 conspiracy theories have become social phenomena. Despite lack of support from scientists, engineers, and historians, 9-11 has also had a major impact on the religious faith of many individuals. For some, it strengthened to find consolidation to cope with the loss of loved ones and overcome their grief. Others started to question their faith or lost it entirely because they could not reconcile it with their view of religion. The iPod is a line of portable media players and multi-purpose pocket computers designed and marketed by Apple Inc. The first version was released on October 23, 2001, and about eight months after the Macintosh version of iTunes was released. As of 2019, the, only the iPod Touch 7th generation remains in production. Nobody uses these anymore. Two thousand and six debut of Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. An Inconvenient Truth is a two thousand and six American concert documentary film directed by Davis Guggenheim about former United States Vice President Al Gore's campaign to educate people about global warming. The film features a slideshow that, by Gore's own estimation, he has presented over a thousand times to audiences worldwide. Since the film's release, An Inconvenient Truth has been credited for raising international public awareness of global warming and re-energizing the environmental movement. The documentary has also been included in science curricula in schools around the world, which has spurned some controversy. A sequel to the film, titled An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power, was released July 2017. Throughout the movie, Gore discusses the scientific option on global warming, as well as the present and future effects of global warming and stress. The global warming is not really a political issue as much as a moral one describing the consequences he believes global warming will produce 
if the amount of human generated greenhouse gases is not significantly reduced in the very near future. Gore also presents Antarctic ice coring data showing CO2 levels higher now than the past 650,000 years. San Francisco internet search leader Google is snapping up YouTube for $1.7 billion. Brushing aside copyright concerns to seize a starring role in the online video revolution. The all stock deal announced Monday unites one of the internet's marquee companies with one of its rapidly rising stars. It came just a few hours after YouTube unveiled three separate agreements with media companies to counter the threat of copyright infringement lawsuits. Remember life before Instagram? Us neither. Before early October of 2010, the only way you could really flex your photos digitally was through a Facebook photo album or photo bucket. Um, how's that for a throwback? Soon things would change. We'd be introduced to a world full of double taps, sponsored influences posts, Valencia filters, DM culture, and IG models galore. Now, the app has more than 1 billion users. Oh, Oprah. She got us through the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, but in May 2011, the queen of daytime talk shows ended her 25 year run. And when we say queen, we mean queen. Her program was the number one talk show in America for the entire time it was on the air and watched by 150 countries. No longer would all these people hear, you get a car and you get a car. Everybody gets a new car because sadly, all good things must come to an end. Kodak's story of failing has its roots in its success, which made it resistant to change. Its insular corporate culture believed that its strength was in its brand and marketing, and it underestimated the threat of digital photography. Encyclopedias written for adults as opposed to children's sets cost thousands. Encyclopedia Britannica, for example, charges $1,400 for the standard hardback version of its popular 32 volume encyclopedia for adults. Collier's standard set of encyclopedias cost $1,500 in 1988. The question, do you wanna build a snowman? can now only be sung thanks to Disney's Frozen, which hit theaters in November 2013. The tale of two princess sisters is the highest grossing animated film of all time and winner of two Academy Awards. It has its own Broadway musical, holiday specials, and a sequel that made $130 million 
in its opening weekend. So obviously, the cold never bothered us anyway. Two thousand eleven, Game of Thrones airs. The series was praised by both television critics and historians for what was perceived as a sort of medieval realism. George R. R. Martin set out to make the story feel more like historical fiction than contemporary fantasy with less emphasis on magic and sorcery and more on battles, political intrigue, and the characters, believing that magic should be used moderately in the epic's fantasy genre. Martin has said that the true horrors of human history derive not only from orcs and dark lords, but from ourselves. Academics have classified the series as neo-medieval, which focuses on the overlapping of medieval history and popular fantasy. A common theme in the fantasy genre is the battle between good and evil, which Martin says does not mirror the real world. Martin explores the relationship between good and evil through the questions of redemption and character change. The series allows the audience to view different characters from their perspective, unlike many other fantasies. From Justin Bieber to Nina Dobrev, it seems that everyone participated in the ALS ice bucket challenge to help raise money and awareness for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The gist, dump a bucket of ice water over your head or donate to ALS Association. Most people actually did both. Then nominate someone else to do the same. In an eight week period in 2014, $115 million was donated through the viral trend. Overall, the organization saw a 30% increase in funding. Nice. Who knew a musical about one of the founding fathers could be so fun? Heartwarming, catchy. Lynn manuel Miranda, that's who, the 16-time Tony-nominated musical and winner of the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Drama, reminded us how good the arts can make us feel and how much they can teach us. It's one of the highest grossing musicals on Broadway, making $3 million for eight performances in a single week. During the 2016 National Football League season, 49ers quarterback Colin Kilpatrick made headlines when he chose to not stand during the national anthem in protest of systemic racism and police brutality that was and is still going on in the United States. Many people, including President Barack Obama, praised Kilpatrick's protest as patriotic, and several fellow football players followed suit. Some teams locked arms and others simply not leaving the locker room until after the national anthem. But Kilpatrick was met with incredible backlash, too, and left the 49ers in 2017. Since then, he's been a finalist for Time's Person of the Year, been given an award by Beyonce, and donated more than $1 million to social justice charities.
accusations against Harvey Weinstein sparked the Me Too movement. Women in Hollywood had for years been trying to speak out against Harvey Weinstein, but it took two indelible pieces of investigative reporting in the New York Times and the New Yorker to finally bring the 67-year-old Miramax and Weinstein Company co-founder down. The horrific news of dozens of accusations of sexual assault and harassment had a silver lining. It brought about the Time's Up and the Me Too eras with powerful men, Matt Lauer, Roger Ailes, Louis C.K., finally being punished for their abuses and sexual harassment and sex discrimination in the workplace, finally being talked about seriously. When Crazy Rich Asians hit theaters, it marked the first time an American film was helmed by an all-Asian cast since 1993's Joy Luck Club. The movie, based on the New York Times best-selling novel of the same name by Kevin Kwan, tells the story of a girl who travels to Singapore with her long-term boyfriend, only to find out his family is mega rich. Speaking of money, the film brought in $240 million, making it the highest grossing romantic comedy in a decade. Since there has been a bit of rom-com renaissance with Netflix leading the charge. The certified diamond hit by Little Nas X is definitely in your 2019 Spotify Wrapped. It was named the longest running number one hit by Billboard magazine in July with 17 weeks on the charts, beating out the record previously held by Mariah Carey and Boys to Men for One Sweet Day from 1995. And the 2017 remix of Despacito from Daddy Yankee and Louis Fonzi and Justin Bieber. We first met Simeon Bales at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro as a member of the Final Five. Just three short years later, at the World Championships in Germany, she would become the most decorated gymnast in the world with 25 medals to her name. She's just 22, by the way. Despacito, American Spanish translated to mean slowly, is a song by Puerto Rican singer Luis Fonzi featuring Puerto Rican rapper Daddy Yankee. Despacito has been widely credited by music journalists as being instrumental in popularizing Spanish language pop music in the mainstream market again. It is a Latin pop song composed in common time with lyrics about desiring a relationship, performed in a smooth and romantic way. Despacito received generally favorable reviews from music critics who praised the fusion between Latin and urban rhythms, its catchiness, and its text painting. It has received Latin Grammy Awards for Record of the Year, 
Song of the Year, Best Urban Fusion Performance, and Best Short Form Music Video at the 18th Latin Grammy Awards. Despacito has also ranked among the best Latin songs of all times and the best songs of 2017 by various publications, which referred to it as one of the most successful Spanish language tracks in pop music history. Okay, so at this point, let's uh, take a look at an article from theweek.com by Jiva Lange entitled 11 Pop Cultural Predictions for the 2020s. Okay, so the streaming boom, Gangnam Style, Baby Yoda, uh, it had have been nearly impossible in 2009 to predict all the twists and turns pop culture would make in the 2010s. Still, while it might be next to impossible to predict what will be the sorry to this man of the 2010s, there are plenty of emerging trends that suggest what the next decade could look like. Here's what our crystal ball says lies in store in the next 10 years of entertainment. Dead stars will be the new alive movie stars. People have been speculating that CGI actors will replace real stars for years, but it seems like the 2020s might be the decade it finally happens. While dead actors like Paul Walker and Carrie Fisher have been resurrected for franchise roles, some creators are already exploring the possibility of casting long gone stars in new original features. Finding Jack, a Vietnam War film currently in pre-production, has reported cast James Dean who died in a car crash at the age of 24 in 1955 in its leading role. It likely won't be the only time we see a dead actor appear in the top billing this decade. Two, Americans get over subtitle phobia. From Roma to the popularity of this year's Parasite, the Farewell, and TV shows like Los as Spooky, more and more foreign language films and shows are reasoning with American audiences. Part of that is likely because of our nation's growing bilingualism. About a fifth of Americans can speak more than one language, a number that is on the rise. Part of it might also be a growing appreciation for our country as a linguistic melting pot. Just look at the crossover popularity, for example, songs like Despacito. This is exciting stuff. Without being limited to English, there are so many more great movies, TV shows, and songs that can be enjoyed. Three, a woman will become the head coach of a major men's sports team. In November, Rachel Balakovic joined the New York Yankees payroll to become the first woman hired as a full-time hitting coach by a big league team. The New York Times reports also this year the Tampa Bay Buccaneers became the first NFL team to hire two full-time female coaches, while four women already on NBA coaching staffs. And while we still might be a few years away from a woman becoming the head coach of a 
major professional men's sports team, it seems like the reign of all male coaches is rapidly coming to an end in America. Streaming will be further blur the lines between TV and movies. When the influential French film magazine, Cathars du Cinema, named a TV show as the movie of the decade, they were deservedly roasted. But the question of what constitutes a movie versus a TV show is increasingly nebulous and confusing. On the one hand, the debate evidenced how good TV has been these past 10 years. When people debate if something like Twin Peaks, The Return is a movie or a TV show, they're usually discussing the quality of production, storytelling, and acting, writes the New York Times. The better a TV show is in this regard, the more likely it is to be referred to as a multi-episode movie. But on the other hand, we've seen medium-bending works on the rise. What of O.J. made in America, for example, which was broken up in installments, but won Best Documentary Feature at the 2017 Academy Awards. We've just experienced the tip of the iceberg here. Don't expect the debate to get picked away anytime soon. Five, Quentin Tarantino will retire. If you believe Quentin Tarantino when he says he's going to retire after 10 movies, then he only has one more movie left in him before putting himself out to pasture. I'm willing to bet that not only do we see his last movie in the next 10 year span, we will see him come back out of retirement for his 11th feature too. If one fact holds true across all decades, it's this one, celebrities never retire. Climate horror will be the new elevated horror. Mankind only has until 2030 to head off catastrophic climate change. But world leaders seem more intent on insulting teenage girls than actually doing anything to help. As such, expect to see climate anxiety become a major theme in horror films around the world in the coming years. While so-called elevated horror by Ari Aster and Jordan Peele and Robert Eggers dominated the 2010s, movies like 2019's Crawl and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, signal a shift. Moving in the, to the 2020s, we'll see an adaptation of Jeff Vandermeer's Hummingbird Salamander inspired by our dystopian present, and like many more, where that came from. Seven, we'll usher in an era of highbrow agitprop. From President Trump being in office to worldwide movements centered around climate change and immigration, it can be easy to look at the modern era and argue that nothing can be apolitical any longer. What's more interesting, though, is the uptick in directors who are using the public's intensified interest in politics to make movies that serve as calls to arms. From 2019 films like Dark Waters and The Report, Thrillers that underscore the broken American political system are more than just propaganda. They 
are a uniquely 21st century genre that's just coming into its own. Number eight, Avatar 2 will finally come out. This feels like the starkest of my predictions, but yes, I do think that more than 10 years after Avatar premiered in 2009, this will be the decade we get the second installment in Jane Cameron's four-part series. At the time of this writing, Avatar 2 is planned for 2021, which means you can peg Avatar 3 to come out sometime around 2033. We'll get a whole series of movies with a female James Bond. The gender swapping movie was a staple in the 2010s when the woman led Ghostbusters, Ocean's 8, or What Men Want, perhaps the biggest classic hero, to have remained so far untouched, though, is the swaggering playboy James Bond, with Daniel Craig assuring that, no, really, he never, ever, ever wants to play 007 again. The space was wide open for creators to cast Laisha Lynch as the new MI6 agent. That being said, hopefully we'll get some original women badasses this decade too. 10. Music, biopics, and documentaries are here to stay. Whether it's a biopic like Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man, or a concert film like Homecoming, it seems as if the whole film industry is betting on music-based movies to fuel the next 10 years of box office and streaming selections. While music movies like Walk the Line and Ray have long been Oscar bait, the combination of 2015's Straight Outta Compton and 2018's Bohemian Rhapsody have exposed just how much money can be made when a huge studio and its subject matters backs a musical biopic, wrote the week contributor Gregory Weichmann. Hang on, this trend is just getting started. We're going to find out what's on the other side of peak TV. Just ask anyone. We're living in the golden age of television, but what's on the other side of peak TV? We're probably about to find out and soon. The anti-heroes of the prestige television era have already become a thing of the past. As streaming takes over as the default mode of watching television, the old standbys of the medium like standardized half hour or hour long reruns are becoming obsolete. And while TV is still generally constructed in standalone episodes or season long arcs, we will likely see creators upend those old givens of the format too. Additionally, we can bid farewell to blockbuster shows that everyone watches like Breaking Bad, Mad Men, and Game of Thrones, as streaming takes the pressure off ratings and allows for more niche and untraditional content. Plus, with Netflix, Amazon, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV, and others throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks, some exceptionally great small budget programs will likely emerge. 10 years is a long time though. I, for one, can't wait to be surprised by it all. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, 
American uh, folklore and uh, popular culture. So we're going to start off with a, an article from the University of Southern California's Anthropology Department. Okay, so folklore is an integral part of being human. The discipline of folklore studies, the unofficial, the spoken, and the traditional forms of expressed culture, such as legends, including urban ones, myths, folk music, jokes, festivals, and more. It is often contrasted with the printed word, yet the recent growth of the internet and digital communications has brought the realms of popular culture increasingly closer to folklore as well. Thus, the field of folklore and popular culture encompasses more than 200 different genres, such as folk tales, myths, legends, proverbs, jokes, games, folk medicine, and ethnomusicology. The interpretations of these materials draws on theories in various fields such as anthropology, communications, English, cultural studies, political science, psychology, sociology, and religion. So our first uh, folklore myth comes from Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth. Ponce de Leon, who made his first journey to the New World with Christopher Columbus on the latter explorer's second voyage, is linked in American folklore as exploring Florida and other Spanish claims in a vain search for the mystical fountain of youth, which he learned from the natives. Uh, we discuss this in our Lit 4 class by way of Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment. Plymouth Rock is the traditional site of the disembarkation of William Bradford and the Mayflower Pilgrims who founded Plymouth Colony in December 1620. From that time to the present, Plymouth Rock has occupied a prominent spot in American tradition and has been interpreted by later generations as a symbol of both the virtues and the flaws of the first English people who colonized New England. In the original story, when Washington was six years old, he received a hatchet as a gift and damaged his father's cherry tree. When his father discovered what he had done, he became angry and confronted him. Young George bravely said, quote, I cannot tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. Washington's father embraced him and rejoiced that his son's honesty was worth more than a thousand cherry trees. This story never happened. The Swamp Fox in the American Revolutionary War. Throughout the Carolina Low Country, Visitors find reference to Francis Marion and the Swamp Fox. They are one and the same. Francis Marion was an officer of the South Carolina militia who escaped from the British when they captured Charlestown and created a band of irregulars to harass British communications, supplies, and patrols during the American Revolutionary War. 
alone or with other irregular bands, the constant sniping and raids had a detrimental effect on British morale, already at a low point due to the malarial climate and blazing heat. It was Marion's prime adversary among the British who gave him the American, the name, the Swamp Fox. During the preparations for the celebration of the centennial of the United States of America in 1876, the story first appeared of Betsy Ross creating the American flag at the request of George Washington. Ross entered American folklore as having sown the famed flag which place the stars representing the colonies on a blue field in a circular pattern. It had long been part of the oral family tradition handed down to such succeeding generations, but there was no empirical evidence to support it, and it has since been discounted by historians as a fabrication created at a time when the contributions by women to the formation of the United States were being touted by women suffragists and their supporters. It remains part of American folklore. If it weren't for Paul Bunyan, America just wouldn't be as interesting geographically. French-Canadian lumber camp legends about Bunyan were later adapted by Americans, claimed that he was delivered to earth by five giant storks since he was already dozens of feet tall as a baby. Whenever, wherever he went, as he got older, he created major landmarks. His footprints created Minnesota's 10,000 lakes. His shovel created the Grand Canyon as it dragged behind him. His use of rocks to extinguish a campfire created Mount Hood. Bunyan was accompanied by his blue ox, Babe, who was almost as big as he was. Statues of Bunyan and Babe have been erected all across the country as a testament to America's love of a tall tale. Unlike a lot of tall tales from America's formative years, the story of John Henry is somewhat based in fact. The problem uh, there probably really was a John Henry who was born a slave in the South in the mid-1800s. Legend has it that he was around six feet tall and weighed more than 200 pounds. And that, in those days, that was big enough to guarantee you'd be given exceptionally tough work, like building railroads or tunnels. If Henry did exist, he likely worked on the Big Bend Tunnel that went through the mountains of West Virginia. From there, the legend has thousands of variations. Some say Henry challenged the tunnel-making machinery to a duel to see who could drive stakes and blast rocks faster. Most stories claim that he won but that he died from exhaustion after the contest. Some say he won and went on swinging his hammer from coast to coast. If you dig too deep into the origins of American folk heroes, you might be disappointed. The man known as Johnny Appleseed wasn't a magical scatterer of apple seeds from sea to shining sea. He was just a regular guy named 
John Chapman, who worked as a nurseryman in the late 1700s. While that's not as exciting as the legend, Chapman's real life was interesting enough. He owned land from Ohio to Indiana, worked as a Christian missionary, and helped make peace between Native Americans and white settlers. Born in 1796, Davy Crockett was nearly a legend without fictitious additions to his story, but they came nonetheless. By Crockett's own account, he killed a bear when he was only three years old. True, maybe not, but Crockett swore it happened. More stories emerge of Crockett's rough and tough childhood with lots of bear, bully, and snake encounters that all ended with him as the victor. Whether or not these stories are true is unclear. What is true is that Crockett represented Tennessee in Congress, but when he was defeated for re-election, he went off to explore Texas. His travels led him into battle at the Alamo, where he was shot and killed. Tales of Davy Crockett show him wearing a coonskin cap and carrying a rifle, which he lovingly called Old Betsy. Geronimo, an Apache leader from the Arizona area, was captured and forced onto a reservation by the U.S. Army in 1876. The persecuted Apache leader fled to Mexico, but after that, things get murky and exaggerated. The story goes that Geronimo's wrath toward the white men was such that he killed thousands over the years using magical powers and ESP to seek them out. It is said that it took many thousands of soldiers and scouts to track the warrior down. By the time Geronimo finally surrendered in 1886, his group consisted of only 16 warriors, 12 women and six children. Geronimo and his people were shipped to Florida, then relocated to Alabama and Oklahoma, where they were placed in prison and reservations. Geronimo died a prisoner of war in 1909. Casey Jones and the train wreck. Jonathan Luther Jones was a Missourian by birth, but the time he spent growing up in Casey led to him being called Casey by all who knew him. He had several instances where he was cited by his employers, mostly for speeding, but his overall record was free of accidents involving injuries to passengers. On the night of April 30th, 1900, Jones was running behind schedule when the train he was driving crashed into the back of a freight train at Vaughan, Mississippi. Jones's actions showed his train sufficiently to save the passengers, but at the expense of his own life in the ensuing crash. James Butler Hickok, better known as Wild Bill Hickok, was a folk hero of the American Old West, known for his work across the frontier as a drover, wagon master, soldier, spy, scout, lawman, gunfighter, gambler, showman, and actor.
Okay, let's talk about uh, American breakfast. Uh, since the earliest days of the United States, Americans began their days by eating whatever was most easily available. These foods often included bread, eggs, or leftover food left over from the night before. Today, ease is still an important factor when it comes to breakfast. However, what people eat has changed over time. And some of today's common breakfast foods, such as cereal, are the result of effective marketing. Arnold Anderson adds, quote, one of the first ways advertising was successful or effectively used to convince mothers that it was okay for their children to eat these instant cereals. It sort of offered working mothers a chance to let kids take care of themselves in the morning. As women entered the workforce to help support their families, cereal was a food kids could make on their own. That's still sort of the power, really, the lasting effect of breakfast as being the first meal that kids do learn how to prepare themselves. Advertising also played an important part in orange juice becoming a morning drink. In 1916, farmers grew more oranges than usual, so advertisers began saying, drink an orange. They aimed to persuade people that drinking orange juice was a healthy way to start the day. Two years later, a worldwide flu epidemic caused people to drink orange juice for its health benefits. As for coffee, it might have been 1773 Boston Tea Party to thank for its popularity in the United States. In that year, American colonists protested British taxation by throwing tea into Boston Harbor. In time, coffee became so popular that People traveling to the American West in the 1830s made sure to carry coffee beans on the journey. Pancakes have been around for a long time. Researchers believe the world's oldest naturally preserved human mummy ate a pancake-like food as one of his last meals. Researchers think pancakes may have been made in the morning because it was much quicker to prepare than bread. Cooks could then have time to make fresh bread for dinner. Okay, so actually the standard fare uh, for an American breakfast would be um, meat, bacon, sausage, uh, ham, eggs, a potato or grits, um, possibly pancakes, waffles, coffee, orange juice, uh, maybe some fruit. Uh, actually came from England uh, during the colonial time when the elite would uh, like to share with their guests a breakfast that included foods from all around their empire. So this standard breakfast fare that you might find in an American uh, breakfast uh, restaurant uh, is actually indeed from England. Okay, so those were kind of the old world ideas of the past about breakfast. But today, uh, young people especially are more uh, conscientious about uh, what they eat. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, breakfast as it is today in 2020. It's making us healthier if your ideal breakfast is a plate of bacon and eggs. There's no judgment here. But 8 out of 10 viewers agree that having a breakfast routine helps them be healthy and want ideas for making breakfast healthier, according to our survey. Plus, 86% of them are eating breakfast every day. No worries if you're not ready to swap home fries for spinach popsicles. It's the new business lunch for sure. You might drip hollandaise sauce on your power suit, but for many business-minded folks, breakfast is outpacing lunch as the best meal for meetings. Why? For starters, it doesn't take up or break up your day. Richard Colerain, chief of staff at Union Square Hospitality Group, told today, and since we're moving more productive first thing in the morning, according to psychologist Roy F. Baumeister, there's no better time to wheel and deal. It's redefining the labor lines at home. According to today's survey, it's dads who are cooking breakfast more and more, citing bonding time with kids as a reason to fire up the skillet every morning. It's now the new first date. Why not meet a potential mate when you're looking and feeling your freshest? I see it all the time, Chef Christina Tosi of Momo Fuku Milk Bar told Today Foods, millennials in particular are increasingly choosing to meet over breakfast or coffee instead of drinks. It's the new happy hour, blame adulting. Instead of partying until the wee hours of the night, wellness-minded people are taking the early bird approach. It's become chic to get up and have breakfast, said Marcelo de Bicey, manager of Bluestone Lane Collective Cafe in New York City. We ate with our cameras. Instagram was one of the first answers, and it came up again and again. All our plates become small plates. This was the decade in which tapas, bar snacks, grazing, wine bar, cuisine, and other trends that had been swirling around for some time finally got together and overthrew the three-course restaurant meal. Vegans got their revenge. Plant-based foods like the Impossible Burger got an enthusiastic reception. Many people of color who cook had a breakout decade. By digging into their cultures and speaking up about their lives, black chefs brought new prominence to black cooking in America, especially its African roots. Chefs from the Philippines, India, South Korea, Vietnam, and other Asian countries cooked in ways that made it impossible not to see them as active, creative, modern interpreters of their cuisines. Ethical treatment wasn't just for farm animals. Some self-induced demise of Mario uh, Batali, Ken Friedman, and John Besh, and other men in the restaurant business following accusations that they had abused and mistreated the women who worked for them 
as a catalytic event. Employees and customers are looking for promises of reform. These were few and slow in coming, but workplace issues like mental and physical health, hostile managers, discrimination, and equal pay are now major topics. The McDonaldization of society. Uh, Ritzer highlighted four primary components of McDonaldization. Efficiency, the optimal method of accomplishing a task. In this context, Ritz has a very specific meaning of efficiency. In the example of McDonald's customers, it is the fastest way to get from being hungry to being full. Efficiency in McDonaldization means that every aspect of the organization is geared toward the minimization of time. Calculability. Objective should be quantified. Example, sales, rather than subjective, example, taste. McDonaldization developed the notion that quantity equals quality, and that a large amount of product delivered to a customer in a short amount of time is the same as high quality products. This allows people to quantify how much they're getting versus how much they're paying. Organizations want customers to believe that they are getting a large amount of product for not a lot of money. Workers in these organizations are judged by how fast they are instead of the quality of work they do. Predictability standardized and uniform services. Predictability means that no matter where a person goes, they will receive the same service and receive the same product every time when interacting with the McDonaldized organization. This also applies to the workers in those organizations. Their tasks are highly repetitive, highly routine, and predictable. Control and standardized and uniform employees. Replacement of human by non-human technologies. It has been argued by a Westerner that an example of this phenomena of McDonaldization can be seen in education where there is seen to be increasing similarity between that of Western classrooms and the rest of the world. Slater argues that the class size, layout, and pedagogy in Peru closely resembles that of America, with clear examples of Western culture focused on efficiency of transfer of knowledge in other parts of the world. Furthermore, Slater goes on to demonstrate that the McDonaldization of education could have many negative side effects, particularly that it does not promote inquiry or creativity. Therefore, schools will become less effective at educating children as they will fail to develop critical and creative thinkers. According to Wong, the influence of McDonaldization has also affected higher education classrooms. Efficiency, computer graded exams, limit the amount of time necessary for instructors to grade their students. Calculability letter, grades, and grade point averages are used and calculated to measure a student's success 
over the course of their academic career. Predictability. Course availability and requirements have become more standardized amongst universities, making it easier to find similar courses and content at different locations. Control. Courses are structured very specifically and must meet certain requirements and follow certain guidelines. Courses begin and end at the same time on the same predetermined days and last for a specific number of weeks. American Cultural Norms Etiquette is protocol, rules of behavior that you memorize and that rarely bend to encompass individual concerns and needs. Manners embrace societal acceptable behavior, of course, but also much more than that. They are an expression of how you treat others when you care about them, their self-esteem, and their feelings. When first introduced to someone, one should be addressed and as Miss, Ms, Mrs, Mr, followed by the surname. Only minors should be addressed by first name. Once a relationship has been established, one may request to be addressed by first name. In particular formal situations such as a request to be considered a sign of trust and intimacy. While professional, academic, religious, military, and political titles such as judge, colonel, mayor, reverend, senator, and doctor are often used in social situations, Ms., Ms., Mrs., and Mr., are also considered appropriate, especially when one is unaware of such credentials. A personal preference should be honored once it is known. Hospitality requires that when extending an invitation as a host, one anticipates and provides for the needs of the invited guests. Strings may not be attached to the invitation. Guest responsibilities include dressing appropriately to the occasion and providing one's own transportation and lodging. As a courtesy, the host may include dress instructions. When receiving an invitation, one is obliged to respond in kind as soon as possible. That means if receiving the invitation by phone, reply by phone, etc. One must accept or decline even if RSVP is not specified. To not do so is an insult to the host. Alcohol. Duh. Alcohol is almost always welcome. Let the type of party dictate what you bring. A small dinner party, bring a bottle of wine, either to share or as a gift for those hosted. A backyard barbecue, bring beer. The key here though, bring more beer than you are planning to drink. The rule of thumb is that if you're going to a place where there will be more than four people, don't bring anything smaller than a 12 pack. A cocktail party. Pretty much anything goes and will probably be appreciated. One very important rule of thumb here is though, is that you leave what you bring. Think of it as a sacrifice to the good 
party. The host hostess gift. There are situations where you just don't bring food or drink. For example, a baby shower, a themed dinner party, etc. Something where every detail has been carefully planned and you're expected to just show up and be the honored guest. In these situations, it can still be really nice to bring a gift to show your appreciation. Although this isn't necessary, I think the hostess gift is one of those bygone traditions worth bringing back. Some examples of the hostess gift include nice chocolates, a candle, a pretty tea towel, a small plant, flowers, or even a simple handwritten thank you note. Don't forget the thank you cards after the party. Make sure your uh, host and hostess uh, receive some kind of thank you from you after it's over. Okay, let's talk about uh, American stereotypes. Um, one is generosity. According to William Bennett, who himself an American, a positive stereotype of Americans is that they are very generous. The United States sends aid and supplies to many countries, and Americans may seem as people who are charitable or volunteer. It's first noted in 1835 the American attitude towards helping others in need. In 2010, Charities Aid Foundation study found that Americans were the fifth most willing to donate time and money in the world at 55%. Optimism. Americans may be seen as very positive and optimistic people. Optimism is seen as the driving force behind achievement of the American dream. Hard-working Americans may be stereotyped as hard-working people, whether in their job or other matters. A workaholic culture. While the stereotype of hard-working Americans is often a positive one, the United States has been criticized in recent years as a workaholic culture. In the Huffington Post, a Serbian who traveled to Washington, D.C. for a degree wrote, quote, In fact, my family and friends had observed what I sh shouldn't have chosen America since I would probably feel better in Western Europe, where life is not as fast-paced as in the United States, and capitalism still has a human face. She noted that Americans still work nine full weeks, 350 hours longer than Western Europeans do, and paid vacation days across Western Europe are well above the United States threshold. Americans have a great deal to learn from Europeans about getting better balance between work and life. Yes, all true. Okay, so let's do a quick uh, wrap up of where we've been today. We covered a lot of subjects, but uh, we wanted to kind of get through 2000 to 2020, uh, which we did very quickly. And we just chose a selection of uh, highlighted uh, items, but in no way did we even begin to scratch the surface of those 20 years. So we did talk about a game called The Sims. 
Um, the beginning of Wikipedia, historic event of 9-11. We talked about a movie, talk, slideshow uh, that became a movie, Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth about climate change. The end of a 30-year television run of Oprah Winfrey the end of the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, Disney's uh, movie Frozen, a TV series called The Game of Thrones, uh, kind of a social fundraising event called the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, Colin Kirkpatrick, uh, athlete, um, the Me Too movement, a movie, Crazy Rich Asians, two songs, uh, one by Little Nas X and Despacito. We tried to make uh, 11 pop culture predictions for the uh, 2020s. And then we took a left turn and kind of went back a little bit and talked about a few of the myths uh, concerning uh, folklore in the United States, starting with uh, Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth, the uh, Plymouth Rock just down the street from me here, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree and his father saying, oh, George, what an honest boy. I'm not going to punish you for cutting down the cherry tree because you're such an honest guy, said no one ever. Talked about a real person called the Swamp Fox from the American Revolutionary War. Uh, a story about Betsy Ross creating the American flag, uh, Paul Bunyan, a giant, uh, John Henry, uh, Johnny Appleseed, a true historic figure, Davy Crockett, and uh, First Nations Indian leader, Geronimo, uh, Casey Jones, and a Wild West personality, Wild Bill Hickok. And we took another path, and we talked about iconic American food and where restaurants are changing and the diet is changing uh, for Americans. Uh, today, it's not just McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King anymore. Uh, we talked about the McDonaldization of uh, society in a business sense and uh, even to uh, higher education. And we touched a little bit on American cultural norms and some American stereotypes. So we really just scratched the surface with all of these uh, titles today. So if any of this is of interest to you for further research, go for it. Dig deeper into it. We just barely mentioned them today. Okay, so I think that's it for today. We're basically out of time. Thanks for watching. Start thinking about your next paper, your final paper, which can be, uh, again, open, that is open for you uh, to choose. So that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Bye.